The rapper is Jizza, a founding member of the legendary Wu-Tang Clan. In 1993, the nine-member group from Staten Island came to wide attention with Enter the Wu-Tang Clan, 36 Chambers, an album considered one of the greatest hip-hop records of all time. It was an exploration of the grime and glory of street life and a look at the human condition, messy, triumphant, honest. Jizza, a.k.a. The Genius, created lyrics that wove through a, a whole sea of references, including 1930s American literature, jazz, chess, philosophy, crime, and martial arts. The album sealed his place as one of rap music's most intricate and able lyricists and performers. In addition to his work with the Wu-Tang Clan, Jizza made solo albums. Liquid Swords, which we were just listening to, went platinum. The beats are menacing and hypnotic. The production is atmospheric, and the lyrical content is typically brainy and complex. Last year, Jizza released his fifth solo record, Pro Tools. He's currently touring it all over the world, though in his performances, he's been paying tribute to the classic li Liquid Swords. Gary Grice, a.k.a. Jizza, a.k.a. The Genius, is in Canada today for the North by Northeast Festival, and he joins us live. Welcome, Jizza. Thank you, thank you. I'm honored. I'm honored. It's a great pleasure to have you. Welcome thank back to you. Canada. It's good to be here. Saw you not too long ago in Halifax, in the oh, fall, yeah. I guess, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, th I, this is probably your first time back to Canada since then, right? Um, no, I think I've you've been second time since then. All right. Since all right. then. Yeah. I, I, I've mentioned you've been performing Liquid Swords all over the world to the total yes. delight of your fans. And I wanted to use that as an opportunity to go back in time with you. Take me back. You're a young guy in the 1980s. What did, what did hip hop mean to you? Everything. Everything. I mean, I just love it. I mean, I grew up from a young age, writing rhymes, and you know, by the time I heard that first rap record, I was hooked. Mm. So, it's, it's a big thing to me, hip hop. And what really. place did it fill in your life? It was, it was something to do. It was a way to express mm. yourself. It's a you know, form of expression, just like any other art, drawing, dancing whatever it may be, it was just a way to express and get things off your chest. The beginnings of you, and also the roots of the Wu-Tang Clan, uh, you, like many hip-hop greats, you started out doing freestyle battles. Uh, this would have been in, in New York in the 80s? Yes. I guess. Uh, can you describe what those first battles were like for you? Well, there's a, there's a difference between what is freestyle nowadays and what it was then. Uh, back then, it was just, it wasn't any particular subject. It was just, you know, going with whatever comes to your head you know, whatever subject you want to rhyme about, but it was still written at the time. Nowadays, freestyle is rhyming off the head and just saying whatever comes to mind and just, you know, being spontaneous with it. So it was a difference than it is now. When, when did you realize that you were in your element, that you were a natural at doing that? When I was able to stand out amongst many, hmm. you know, when, when it wasn't even a challenge for others that was around. <laughs> I mean, well, it's true though, right? I you, mean, that's, you, how, that's how you know when you compare. I you, mean, that's, that's the only way to know when you compare and contrast your work with others, so. Were you ever actually defeated? No. No. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. No, I mean, we, we have entered contests throughout the years when we were younger and we didn't win them all, but we still felt like we, we weren't defeated. But so, so you're a kid. I mean, I, I get that you know you're good at it when you're beating other people. But when you're a kid, when did it just feel like this feel like a natural form of expression for you? When did it just start coming out of your pores? At a very young age. Yeah. Maybe around the age of 11. I mean, rhyming started off for me. It started off with um, nursery rhymes, Mother Goose, and all those other songs and rhymes that we learned while growing up and um i pretty much knew a lot of those by heart word for word and then i just started writing my own rhymes and taking from other stories and other works and blending them mixing them together until i actually started creating my own stuff when you talk about uh, taking references and and we talk about the record liquid swords what strikes any listener about your lyrics as i said before is the sheer range of references can you, can you remember what was inspiring you intellectually back in those days? I get inspired by many, many different things. Um, it can be anything. It could be art, music. I can get inspired from someone's story. I mean, throughout history, like far as entertainment, when you watch 
the stories of others and what they went through and what they had to go through to make it and get on. Very interesting stories, but kind of similar to the same thing we went through. We tried for years to get a deal. We sent out demos to record labels, and we wrote letters, and we did, you know, everything we can mm. to get on. But, um, you know, inspiration can come from anything, not just music itself. It could come from music. It could come from your parents. It can come from nature. I get inspired by many different things. Martial arts has been an inspiration. You, you took uh, concepts from old Kung Fu movies and applied them in your lyrics. You, you yeah. call Staten Island Shaolin, and the title Liquid Swords refer, refers to battle rapping. What parallels do you find between those movies and life and, and the hip hop scene? Well, if you, if you take Kung Fu or martial arts, if you go back to the flicks, usually it was always someone who was skilled trying to challenge someone else's skills. That's kind of like what hip hop is. That's what it was for us back then. We used to travel through the borough, from borough to borough, or neighborhood, neighborhood, town to town. And we would just look for whoever was said to be the best in that town, and we would just challenge them, you know, <laughs> pull out our sword, and we'd challenge them. And um, that's usually what a lot of Kung Fu flicks and martial art flicks are, are about, you know, challenging, friendly battle though, not, mm. not to the death, but a friendly. <laughs> Just to some I injury. I know hip hop has <laughs> become crazy nowadays with all this beef and battling, which is really crazy. But I mean, martial arts played a big role in our lives while growing up. I mean, I, we grew up watching Bruce Lee, you know, back then. And then we started watching others that came after him, yeah. Jet Li, Jackie Chan. and. Um, you know, like most, I mean, it's a action hero. Most little young boys love action heroes to this day. I mean, I've never had a Bruce Lee costume, but I had a Superman one and a <laughs> Spider-Man. And, you know, so those, those are just action heroes. But aside from just kicking and, and flipping, I mean, the, the principles, I mean, just martial arts is not just a form of self-defense. It has a philosophy that applies to it, which you can apply to life. I mean, like one of the things they say is that, um, the best way of winning is without fighting. So, you know, mm. I think that's, that's deep within itself. Uh, I love that you, I love that you had a Superman costume. I, lo I love that your hero was a white guy in leotards. <laughs> 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 it's not so bad. You know, when you talk about what hip hop has become, it's also be become, and, and I know you're talking as part of North by Northeast, you're talking to Fab Five Freddy, who's, who's, uh, who's been on this, this program as well, and who's one of the pioneers. Yes. And, Big pioneer. you know, uh, you guys, from when you started to now, I wonder, I mean, in the mid 1990s, the Wu Tang Clan had established yourself as one of the best hip hop crews, but you're also one of the most financially successful, enormously successful financially. How did that affect your music? Or to put it another way, how did you uh, not let that affect your music? Well, I think when, when we started off as Wu Tang Clan, I mean, two of us already had solo deals, myself and RZA. But um, when we started off as a group, there was nine of us in the group, and we, we got a deal with Loud, RCA, Steve Rifkin, but we didn't get any money. So we, it was kind of like good and bad because we didn't really get a, a big advance mm. at that time. We were just starting off, but we had so much freedom as far as our deal and it allowed us to pursue solo careers and branch out. And, and no one was really doing that at that time. So it kind of just opened doors for a whole lot of other artists to follow suit and be able to be Jizza, part of Wu-Tang, and be Jizza, who was a solo, and then get with two other guys and form another group. So mm. I, that's what Wu-Tang started. Came but, in. but do you think that materialism on some level, or money uh, at some level uh, is, is, is counterproductive to hip hop or, or, or has been problematic? Yeah, it is. It all depends on what it does to you. One thing I heard someone say, I don't know what they said, the, the, the best way to, to um, measure someone's success is to measure it by what it has done to them and for them, what kind of person they have become after being famous or you know being mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. in the industry. And... Um, a lot of times money, you know, money is a main factor in a lot of things. And, you know, I mean, if I'm 
started off getting $2,000 a show then and I'm getting $10,000 a show now. Of course, I don't want to settle for $3,000 for a show. It all depends. But um, it's not really about, you know, we make a, a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Mm. And it's all about giving back. And I think that as far as money, money can really, really change you. I mean, it, it, it plays a major role, but it all depends on what you, you let it do to you as a person. I mean, of course, the more money you get, the, you know, the more you can do, the more you can travel. You know, you can get a bigger house, bigger home, or whatever, but, you know, it's not all about money. I never got into this for money. I mean, I started rhyming before rap was even on wax. Mm. Yeah, mm. I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, was, it was just all about the love for it. I mean, I hear a lot of great musicians and singers say that, you know, they, they don't do it for the money. A lot of the great soul singers from sure. back in the days. And um, the difference nowadays is a lot of hip hop artists and a lot of young, young children are trying to get into it because they think they can get a lot of money, they can wear the bling bling, they can drive the cars. And even with kids wanting to be athletes because they figure it's an easy way out and make a lot of money where you have you know, several hundred thousand engineer jobs that's just sitting because kids don't want to be engineers. They want to be athletes and rappers. But I didn't get into it for that. I got into it because I have love for it. So you what, do you, what do you say to them in terms of how, how to, uh, to, to use the often used term, how to keep it real? I mean, how, how do you continue, how did Wu-Tang Clan continue to identify as those kids from Staten Island? If you're talking to one of those young I think young because... We came to the people, or, you know, I come to the people as the people. So usually fans, they have this idea. Like people, you know, one thing about distance that is, creates this certain illusion, that's the illusion that distance creates. So if you're on the outside looking in, you don't really know, you know, the grass seems always green on the other side. And a lot of times... People don't know what it's like until you get to the other side. And usually fans, depending if they don't really know you and they're not really familiar with your music, they just know you're famous. They just figure you're just a certain type of person that, you know, like if I, if I came here in a small four door, you know, someone might say, why are you not in the limo? Right. <laughs> and where's your security? And where's your, you know, so they get this idea of, of what it's not really, you know, they, they see you as one way that you're not. But the thing I would say about Wu-Tang is that we, we came to the people as the people. Like, I, I never have a problem. Sometimes I do shows and I sign autographs for everyone in the, in the place. Sometimes I don't. I mean, you just have to be able to be touched, reached, you know. Your person just like them is no difference. And I think that's the way people should think as artists. It's really because good. it's the fans that make you big for who you are, you know, by buying your music. <laughs> I'm tempted to ask when you don't want to sign for them. <laughs> but Because mm -hmm. you said sometimes you don't. Yeah, well, it all depends. I mean, usually I have this thing where if I sign one, you got to all. sign them right. all. I got you. But it, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes I got to turn my back. And what it's just, it's, it's not a good thing. It's, sure. it's really good. I mean, it's, it's been an honor to have you on this show and, and that you agreed to come and do this. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of time with you here. I do want to ask you about the Wu Chess Clan. Right. So, <laughs> so you're, you love chess. You're obsessed or you're really interested in chess. I love chess. Why are you so into chess? It's the greatest board game ever. I mean... <laughs> I mean, checkers is no comparison, and <laughs> Monopoly is not in his league. Right. I mean, I mean, chess is just it's a strategic game. It's a it's a mind game. You gotta have a lot of patience. You gotta have a lot of patience. So you, I mean, enough to watch a flower grow. You need patience like that. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. So, so your cousin and fellow founding member of, of Wu Tang, uh, yes. who you mentioned earlier, Riza, has gone on record as saying he beats you consistently at chess. I don't know about consistently. <laughs> um, um, we go back and forth. We go back and forth. You know. Does and and chess inspires you musically as well? Oh, so much. I mean, if you look at the Liquid Swords album cover, that's a chessboard. That's a match on a chessboard. That's how much I'm inspired 
by it. I mean, I love to play. You know, I, I once did this, uh, when I was in university, I did this study on, like a, a little essay, on how chess breaks down on gender lines, because uh, women generally don't tend to play chess as much as men do. And, and I didn't know, I was trying to find the reasons for that. Some people said it's because it's a, it's, it's, it's a warlike game and, and men have this, you know, the machoism bred into them. Some people say that uh, women just, uh, like, uh, there's too many things to do in the world. I don't want to be sitting in front of a board game for four hours. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what's your sense of why guys uh, like chess so much? I think, I think guys and girls like it. More and more females are starting to play chess nowadays. It's coming up, we is it, whole, Chess? We have several grand ma female grandmasters. There's a lot of them out there. So I think, you know, it's not the um, nerdy geek thing anymore. You know, the kid with the glasses. Not if you're playing it. It's not. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I just think it's a great game. It opens your mind. You know, it's, it's all about connecting combinations. I mean, there's this interesting story about, about chess that I read in one of the books um, about how deep the game is because they say once you know you, you you make your first few moves there's a infinite amount of variations infinite right which seems crazy right but um it was once this king i don't i don't i forget where he was from india or something like that okay and um every day they would bring him young king they would bring him like um entertainment for his pleasure you know if he was bored you know they just bring something to right him. and one day some one of his servants brought the game of chess to him which was introduced by a, 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 a merchant or a, pe a peddler, something like that. So when he brought the game to the king, he was so fascinated and overwhelmed by the game that he told his, his servants to go find the guy who showed him this game right. and bringing him to him. And he should want for nothing because he was filthy rich. <laughs> and he said, he, you know, he should want for nothing, bring him to me. So they brought the guy and, and to the king and, he explained to him how he loved the game so much and, and, and he would give him anything he want just for him learning the game. So whatever it is you want, let me know. So the guy said all he would want from him is grains of sand, wheat, grains of wheat. Grains yeah. of wheat. Yes. Okay. So um, now the, you've got me hooked. Where, kid, where is this yeah, going? Yeah, because I was hooked too when yeah. I was reading it. I, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> like most of them are probably thinking, like, why he didn't ask for gold or silver, right. you know, a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. So, um, grains of wheat. Grains yeah. of yeah. wheat. So he said, just give me a grain of wheat for each square on the board. Mm. So you give me one grain for the first square, and then the second square you give me two, and then you double it each square. Now, 64 squares on the board. And so the king lost his empire. Right. So right. so when they didn't have calculators at that time, so he got his <laughs> mathematicians to, to add it all up and figure out what it would be. So they came they came back him back to him the next day and they, they said, you know, King, we, we can't afford to pay this this guy that. He said, What do you mean? I'm I'm rich. He said, That amount of grain will stretch around the earth about three times and the, the no the numbers was in the like quintillions. Right. And when I was reading it, you know, I started doing it myself in my head. So I just was rounding everything off. One, two, four, eight, right. 16. And by the time I got to the fourth. You weren't using a calculator. No. By right. the time I got to the fourth row, I was in the billions already. So it's a deep game. <laughs> <laughs> So, mm. so the upshot of that is that chess is a deep game. Yes. What Tori is giving me a, a note here. No, uh, move me. Oh, yes, thank you. And I got that in my ear. I appreciate it. It's Tori mm. Allen, our producer. She was just me. You know, I have to tell you. Actually, I'll tell you. I might as well tell you. She just we. Well, uh, Mio Edelman. He's a guy. He comes on. He's one of our regular uh, characters or regular contributors. <laughs> On the show, old friend of mine. He's he's our he's our internet columnist. He he discovers new things. He's got a, a segment called the Download Download, and he flipped out when he found out that he was going to be on the same show as you. In fact, he was going to follow you. Now we've gone almost to the end of the clock here, so he's we're going to put him a little later in the show now. Yeah. But I hope he doesn't get heartbroken. Mia, where are you? <laughs> Mia, you want do you want do you want to come meet Jizza? Mio, 
I, I'm just doing this because I have never seen, you follow a lot of... I, we, didn't, we, I didn't freak out that much, don't worry. <laughs> well, actually, you I, did. Well, you're not supposed to tell him that. I was just playing it cool. I was just like, I was just like, that's nice. He's coming. That's great. <laughs> Well, I was going to get you to tell us what, what Wu-Tang has meant to you, but, you, you know, it's, it's your choice. Well, uh, well, you know, I, I actually, you know, this is a very interesting story. I, I actually didn't know you guys when you, I, I listen to music sometimes like five or six years after it comes out, right. because I get so tired of people hyping on music, right? Yeah. Like, you can't actually appreciate. So I actually didn't start hearing your music until, like, just like about five or six years ago, uh, uh, my brother-in-law gave me uh, the, the 36 Chambers. Right. <laughs> And, uh, Is that your brother-in-law? What? <laughs> and and it just it just blew my mind. And and I grew up I grew up in the '80s as well. And, and I just you know just hip hop what, whatever hip hop has become you know I mean there's some good stuff out there, but it's not like it's just not like that. You know what I mean? And it's just it's just that's that's all I wanted to say to Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mio. You just. Thank you, Mio. <laughs> I hope you're okay with that. Oh. I mean, he's, you just... That's, he, that's inspiration. He's going to be talking, you, yeah. he's, a, he's a Jewish Japanese kid, and your, your music has reached out to him, so that's not so bad. Hey, man, it's been a pleasure to have you thank here. Thank you. Thanks for making the here. time. Thank you, thank you. Cheers to everybody. One of the founding members of the legendary hip-hop group, the Wu-Tang Clan, currently on tour with his latest album, Pro Tools. If you're in Toronto this weekend, Jizza performs as part of North by Northeast Music Festival on Sunday at Young and Dundas Square. And for more information, you can visit his MySpace page. We'll put a link to that from cbc.ca.